Okay, see, this is John Bush. And uh, I'm beginning a lecture series. I put together a lecture series on Miocene aquifers in the Palouse Basin. Uh, if you're interested in my credentials and background, they will be at the end of the lecture series. So if you want to jump ahead and see what my experiences and credentials are, you can look at them if you're so concerned. Uh, to the left on the diagram is a diagram of the Palouse Basin Aquifer System uh, outlined with the dashed lines. Uh, that's the, the area of what we call the Palouse Basin. The name came about back in the 1990s. Some of the boundaries are easy to draw. The gray areas represent areas underlined where the underlying rocks contain Miocene basalt flows and Miocene sediments about 16 million years in age, and that's where our water comes from. The boundaries with the aquifer system are easily drawn where they come in contact with what we call basement rocks shown here in red. The basement rocks consist of granites, uh, quartzites, and they're generally impermeable. So that's outside what we call the Palouse Basin, and they rise above an elevation among the lower elevation Miocene rocks that, that make up our aquifer uh, system. It's easy to draw those lines around where it comes in contact with the basement rocks because you have a permeable boundary coming against an impermeable boundary. Some of the other areas, and we'll discuss that in one of our lecture series, some of the areas like over at Albion, uh, the boundary is drawn simply on hydrological data supported by geologic data. So the, the purpose of the talk, the objective, the overall objective is, let me see how come I'm not getting it. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, the overall objective is to bring together the information on the aquifer system into one generalized model. Um, some people have asked, it's a good question, why can't we get a model? Why isn't it, it should be simple to calculate how much water we have and how much we have for the future. But it hasn't been that easy. And it's primarily because you know, our aquifer system here along in Moscow Poland area, even though it's small in comparison to the regional distribution of the Columbia River basalts and sediments, it's very small. But it's very complex. It has a, a lot of variation in geology. The sediments are interbedded with the basalts. The basalts change from one location to another. Um, and so therefore, uh, one study into the area, whether it be geology or hydrology or geochemistry, no one study has been able to come up with a generalized model. The same problem, whether it's numerical or whether it's qualitative, it's been difficult to piece it together. So the objective to here is to bring together information on the aquifer systems from different disciplines and put them into one model. And this is my diagram to show how I put the pieces, what I call the pieces and parts together. Uh, most people would start off with the hydrological reports down here on the right, uh, right side of the diagram. Generally, you uh, would maybe run a pump test, do some geochemical analysis, uh, and then you would calculate your hydrological parameters, and then you would compare it to the other areas to see how that, how that fits. My, my way, or this way of putting together the model, starts off with geologic history and all these 14 different areas plus some others. And then we look and compare that to the hydrological reports. Um, don't get uh, baffled by the fact that you may not know what some of these disciplines are. The, uh, I'm not an expert in all of them. The idea to put together any kind of model is to boil down the data, get down to the key, get down to the key or keys that any kind of study does, and then bring those keys together and see how they relate to each other. So 
in the talks, in the lecture series, it is, they are set up to discuss, get to boil down the data to what that particular study shows and then relate it to the others to come up with a generalized model in the end. So it's a little bit different than uh, we're used to seeing for hydrological models. Uh, it's based on uh, the oil companies use of putting together their types of conceptual models, bring in all the data, boil it down, get it something that's simplified, something that maybe can last for, for a couple of decades, maybe something that you can use just to think in. It's not all, it doesn't produce the answer, it produces a framework within the thing. When you hear me talking, uh, it's not always my ideas. I listed some people here uh, over my 50 years uh, of being somewhat interested at times, very interested at others in the uh, Miocene aquifer systems in Moscow pulmonary. Many of the ideas come from discussions with other people, not always the research papers. These are just some of the people that I remember that contributed a key thought or a key piece of information, particularly with discussions, even though it's the articles which sometimes help. These people are drillers, uh, they're farmers, uh, students, professional hydrologists, geologists, PBAC members. So it's a collection of lots of people's thoughts. They're not just, just mine. And it's evolved over a period of time from 1967 when I first came to Moscow until the present day. What we need to do here in the lecture series, in this introduction to the lecture series, and go over some of the basic terms that we will use throughout this, all the lectures and make sure we got a basis for our thinking. And once again, it doesn't matter whether you have lots of knowledge or just beginning to learn, the lecture series will boil it down to some of the keys that we'll need to understand to put the whole thing together. Now, this is a conceptual diagram of how our uh, aquifer system works in the upper portion, just the upper portions in the Moscow area. And it is attempting to illustrate relationships that are similar throughout the whole Palouse Basin. Over here on the right and top, we have the red rocks illustrated with those little dashes. Uh, those are the impermeable rocks which rise above the aquifer rocks and go underneath the aquifer rocks. So you can think about up there where the word basement rock is. That could be Moscow Mountain. Uh, Moscow Mountain is made up of granite, the basement rocks of granite, and also quartzite, the two main rock types. They're relatively impermeable. So there's a sharp boundary in the surface and subsurface between the bedrock and the aquifer rocks. The aquifer rocks illustrated here in blue, green, and yellow, uh, consist of basalt flows and sediments. On this diagram, uh, the yellow are the sediments. This is because we're on the eastern side of the Palouse Basin where sediments dominate. And uh, let's go down as if we were walking from Moscow Mountain. Let's walk down from Moscow Mountain down into the city. And like I said, up on top, we would be sitting up there at Twin, Twin Peaks, uh, very impermeable rocks, slightly weathered, and eventually we could walk down until we encountered some sand channels where I encountered what we call the sediments of Bowlville, which in the Moscow area is the first geologic unit beneath the Lutz. So we might not see all these uh, crops. We may have to dig a, take a shovel and dig a ditch dig a hole, may have to take a drill rig and drill down because the loss tends to cover everything, the loss in the soil. But the first rocks we would encounter would be the sediments of Bowlville. The sediments of Bowlville, like all the other sediments, are pretty simple in the sense that they uh, uh, contain primarily uh, sand, 
and clay. Now there are other components, there's wood fragments, there's gravels and those kinds of things. But again, we want to boil it down, to simplify our thinking, the primary content of all the sediment units is clay. There are clay rich sediments. The clays are the impermeable units. There's about 30% of the sediments are shown here in the sand dots, but 30% of the sediments are sand size. Sand size being a, a grain that is just barely visible to something about an eighth of an inch, two millimeters in diameter. The sand zones, the sand areas in the sediments is where the water is because they have the ability to, when they're saturated, they have the ability for water to move through it into your well or down through the subsurface. The general idea that I see sometimes in the papers and so forth is that there's a lake down there. The water is not in the lakes. Water is in the saturated zones of sand in the sediments. As we head towards Moscow, walking down this slopes, we might come across outcrops of a basalt flow, hard rock. Uh, in Moscow, you can be, see a lot of these uh, exposures on the western end of the, of the city just as you approach the Washington State uh, boundary. That, those outcrops are a part of a lava flow which we have named the basalt, the, the lava, excuse me, the low, low flow. The low, low flow uh, covers the entire area. It's the most extensive basalt flow in the area. Uh, it's sort of isolated. It's in the sense that it is overlain by the sediments of Volvo, which we mentioned. But if you drill through it, you in almost every location, you'll come across the vantage member. It, like the sediments of Bowville, contains water where the sands are saturated and no water where there's clays, which are impermeable. The basalt itself, look at the basalt of Lowell itself. It's a little confusing because some people have referred to it as an aquitard, which is a, a layer of material that it resists vertical percolation of water but it's also referred to as an aquifer. Let me explain that a little bit. When you're drilling a well in a Moscow area and all through the, uh, actually the, the Palouse Basin, you're likely to encounter a little bit of water right at the top of the flow. That's because the top of the flows are fractured and the water can fill in those fractures so the rock becomes saturated. But interesting enough, as you drill through it, in the central part, you typically do not uh, encounter much water. And sometimes you drill mostly through the whole flow and encounter no water. You get down to the bottom of the flow and there you encounter another zone of fractures and it will, if saturated, will be a resource for your well or resource of the water. So what's confusing is, is that the low, low flow, for example, or any thick basalt flow, Low, low flow averages about 165 feet in thickness over the whole uh, Palouse Basin. It's both an aquifer and an aquitar. So in other words, you can get water out of it, particularly domestic wells, but it's also resistant to water. So it's not like some people would like to visualize it as one layer of water through in that 165 feet. No, it's particular zones of water and in the basalts, where's the water? The water's in the saturated fracture. Now this same diagram shows the top of what we call the Grand Ronde basalts. The illustrator here in green. Generally when you uh, penetrate the Grand Ronde, and by the way, since we walked to Moscow to, to see the, uh, the low low flow, the vantage member and the Grand Ronde flow are only exposed at the surface in one place in Pullman, where you can see a small outcrop of the Grand Ronde, the uppermost Grand Ronde, and an outcrop of the vantage member. That's why we have to depend on interpreting well data to understand the geology area. But this contact is significant between 
the lower part of the vantage member and the upper part of the grand rond. That's where we tend to uh, make the contact or the division between what we call the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer. So the upper aquifer generally consists of the vantage member, the low, low flow, and the sediments of bowl wheel. The lower aquifer generally consists of primarily basalts, but also some inner bed sediments, and they're within what we call the Grand Ronde rocks. It gets a little confusing uh, because we name the aquifer systems oftentimes between uh, for the basalts that are contained within that aquifer system. So like the low, low flow belongs to the wampum formation. So a lot of publications and a lot of people refer to our upper aquifer as the wampum aquifer. But it leads to a little bit of misunderstanding because most of the water, for example, in the upper aquifer in Moscow doesn't come from the basalt, it comes from the sediments. Now underneath our lower aquifer contains is entirely contained within uh, basalts of the, that are named the Grand Ron. Well, the Grand Ron is 2,000 feet thick beneath Pullman, so there's a lot of uh, aquifer layers. It's not just one aquifer. We tend to use the word aquifer, but you actually derive water from uh, individual flow flows and also from the sediments. So we tend to use that boundary and we tend to use the name Grand Ron. I like to use for Moscow area, I like to use the word lower aquifer. It doesn't matter. Uh, the point is the lower aquifer is in Grand Ron rocks. The basalts of the upper aquifer belong to the long term. But never forget that even though we're using basalt names, that the aquifer system actually consists of a, a interlayered basalt flows and interlayered sediments. So that gives you a little idea of where the upper aquifer and lower aquifer start. Now, one thing to understand, and we'll do that right here, we're right here at the boundary, is that the gradation from the upper aquifer into the lower aquifer is generally sudden and it doesn't always occur right at the boundary on the uppermost grand run. The real definition or the real key that separates out the use of the term upper aquifer versus lower is their water levels. The water levels in the upper aquifer are 100 to 150 feet higher than those are in the lower aquifer. And that break, that change in water level can be sudden uh, right as you drill into or as you approach the Grand Ron flow. I have been on wells where I've seen the upper aquifer water levels drop Im immediately when you drill into the first Grand Ron flow. And I've been on some wells that you have to go almost 100 feet before the water levels drop. The real difference generally described as occurring at the contact on when you penetrate the uh, uppermost Grand Ronfra. But the world definition is they have separate water levels widely apart and are generally not considered to be very well interconnected. So that gives us a little coverage of some of the basics. I've got to give me a second here. Sometimes I'm a little slow in bringing up my next picture. So let's look at a generalized diagram of what these aquifer units look like in the subsurface in a lateral view. So here's a generalized cross section from east to west. This generalized cross section is based on uh, details from uh, close to 30 some wells. And it's a slice in the subsurface uh, from Moscow to Pullman. Uh, let's uh, give you a little perception of what the subsurface is like. Let's take the blue flow here where I got the cursor on. Uh, that is the basalt of Lolo. The belongs to the upper aquifer. It extends across the entire area. And even though this diagram is not the scale, 
give you a sense here, it's an average is about 160 feet in thickness. As you look at the green area, the green area are the Grand Ronde rocks. Lots of names for individual basalt flows, but in general, I think we can just talk about it as Grand Ronde, uh, Grand Ronde. Over in Pullman, this line represents about where WSU well number seven is located. That well is the deepest well we have in the area. It was meant to be a production well and a research well. So it's 2,250 feet deep. And so all total, the basalts and sediments in Pullman approach at least 2,700 feet and maybe thicker because the well did not penetrate basement rocks. It was at the lower end of the Grand Ronde basalts, but it had not penetrated the total thickness. So this sort of gives you a general idea of, of the size and the thicknesses. If we come back over here to Moscow, the yellow are the sediments. And I have broken the area into three segments across this east-west cross-section. Segment A is dominated by sediments shown in yellow. Uh, the lower sediments are referred to as the sediments of Moscow, the Vantage member, and the sediments of Bolville. Uh, the water that we obtain in the Moscow area, in the Idaho side, this line here you see, the first line, is about the location of the Idaho State, Washington State boundary. Segment A, our water from both aquifers, both the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer, is primarily obtained from sediments. It's not totally a basalt aquifer system. And you can see the difference as you move west, get into the middle part out here in segment B, and the diagram illustrates that the uh, uh, most of the area, most of the lower aquifer is all Grand Ronde, green, so uh, layer by layer of basalts, very few sediments. So if you were to drill a well out in this area, you can not hit as many sediments as you hit in Moscow. They'll be very thin. And most of the aquifer system are horizontal basalts, meaning relatively flat. In contrast to the sediment rich uh, uh, system in the Moscow area. Uh, so when you're driving across the state boundary, you're following the low, low flow. All the outcrops you see in the quarries, all the outcrops in the road cuts are all the low, low flow. So you follow that low, low flow. Just remember, you're driving over a thick sequence of horizontal basalt flows with minor sediments. We get to Pullman, and as you realize, you get to Pullman, you got to drive down into Pullman. You got to drive down into Bishop Creek to get down uh, Bishop Street, excuse me, not Bishop Creek, uh, to where you're getting you where you're getting down to the bottom of the low, low flow, and the low, low flow. Once you get to Pullman starts to be wrinkled, I call it, or folded. It down drops into the bottom part of the city and then rises again on the western part of the city. So you're reaching an area where the basalts are not horizontal. Uh, they're primarily wrinkled, I call them, upfolds and downfolds, not big ones. To give you a little idea, uh, if you go from the municipal building for Pullman, the city of Pullman along the South Fork of the Palouse River. At that area, take the elevation off of the top of the low, low flow or the elevation of any of the contacts between the flows and trace them to the west. And within four miles, those contacts have dropped 200 feet. So part of segment C is the rocks are wrinkled and they dip, slope, to the west. So when I look at this, I go, well, the geology is pretty complex. I used to call them subbasins, and I think I like segments now. What's interesting is in this system is the upper aquifer. If you follow the cursor along the top of the Grand Run, the upper aquifer changes in the thickness of its components. In Moscow, heavy 250 
feet, 300 feet of the vantage member, it rises, you get into sigma B, and the vantage is very thin. The low low keeps its consistency, but now the aquifer system and the upper aquifer consist primarily of basalt flow and a thin vantage flow. The brown on here, the light brown, is the LUS. And most of our discussions throughout the lecture series will not talk about the LUS. Technically, it's it's somewhat interconnected to the upper aquifer, but it's, uh, it's not that important in understanding where our water resources come from. As you get into the central part of the area, the upper aquifer does not have much water. The upper aquifer has a lot of water, municipal supplies over in segment A. As you head to the west, again, the flows dip, and interestingly enough, you would think of, well, uh, these wells over in Pullman all come from the basalts. And this is WSU 7 again. It's pointing out something interesting that's in very important to kind of understand about our aquifer system. As we went down through the salt flows, water does come from individual fractured layers we call intraflow zones. And you keep accumulating water as you go deep. The number one producer is all at the same level, all past major production wells, all present major production wells are getting the primary source of water is out of a sediment layer. So it's not just a basalt sequence or basalt aquifer, it's an aquifer of both basalts and sediments. The lower part of the well the research part of the well, which went down to 2,200 feet, did not encounter very many uh, aquifer, prolific aquifers. And in general, we're going to not pay much attention to the lower part. It has the same water levels as the upper part, but there's not a lot of resources down there. There's no need to drill that deep to get water, since most of our water that we're producing now comes around to the upper Grand Ronde. Our lower aquifer water comes from the upper part of the Grand Ronde. This is in a system that's uh, uh, a sequence that's from about 400 feet thick, maybe up to 600 feet thick. That same interval extended into Moscow, into the sediments of Bullsville is where we retain, excuse me, excuse me, sediments of Moscow uh, is where we obtain most of our water in Moscow. So the water, that we're using out of the lower aquifer system, which is the primary source right at this present time, all of our municipal water is coming from uh, these uh, lower aquifer system, which is concentrated here in the upper part of the Grand Ronde flows. I still like to refer to it as the lower aquifer because the Grand Ronde in Moscow is not the same as the Grand Ronde in Spokane or Wenatchee or Yakima. We have our own characteristics producing different hydrological parameters than those other areas. Let's see, we're going to go on down here and see if I missed anything in our introduction here to the lecture series. Uh, we, I should have mentioned these things. The water is from fractures in the Miocene basalts and from the coarse grain sediments, the sands and the sediments. Presently, most of our municipal water is from the lower aquifer. We have pumped, Moscow is the only area in which you could pump municipal water or has municipal water capabilities, still has. Uh, we stopped pumping from that uh, upper aquifer in terms of municipal wells in 2017. We do get domestic water out of the upper aquifer, but at the present time, all of our municipal water is primarily coming from the lower aquifer. Uh, we use about 2.3 billion gallons of water a year, and it's coming from the lower aquifer. One thing I didn't mention, why do we spend this time for this lecture series, and why are we spending money uh, into the understanding of aquifer system? Because even though we have a tremendous supply of water. We have every year, we have continued water level declines and that's a concern. That concern has been around since the 1940s. And that's the main reason 
for this lecture series and the main reason we will need to con conduct research into the future. The aquifers are very complex. They're not just a simple basalt aquifer, a simple sediment aquifer. The basalts and the sediments are intertangled, interlayered, and we have different hydrological parameters. When I say hydrological parameters, what's that mean? Well, how fast does the water move through it? Uh, how much how much water is stored there? Uh, is the rocks is the is the aquifer a permeable? Meaning, can it can water move through it easily or not? Those parameters change across our Palouse Basin. Uh, so we need to try to, how do we figure this out? That's been the, that's been the holdback, is that it's not a simple way to compute how much water we have, to understand why, how, why are we dropping a foot every year. To understand the aquifer system, it requires the knowledge of many of its parts. And that's what the lecture series is about. It's going to boil it down into the basic keys. And throughout it, I will provide the references that if anybody's interested in where the details are coming from, we'll provide the, the references and sources uh, which can lead you into uh, more information. But the lecture series is an attempt. Well, I won't say an attempt. It does boil things down to uh, sort of the keys, and we'll try to put those key together because it requires a knowledge of many of its parts or many of its keys. So that's where that's the general information and the series, the lecture series outline is going to talk about first, the next lecture is on the Palouse Basin boundaries. Uh, it's a short talk. Uh, it's only about 20 minutes long, uh, but it's important to understand what we mean by the term Palouse Basin. Uh, we have a Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee which has supported research and has been concerned for since the 1940s. It was named the uh, Palouse Basin in the 1990s. So we need to know what area and why we, how we come up with the boundaries. Before we get into the hydrology parts, we're going to talk about the origin of Miocene aquifer rocks. The origin points out certain key elements that are important and help us extend our knowledge throughout the basin. For example, a lot of people will ask, well, we don't need to know about the origin. So this well here in Moscow tells us uh, how thick the basalts are. And we, we just want to know, we want to know what the rocks are like and the one that don't need to know the origin. Well, the origin tells us how we can extend our knowledge. For example, we don't have any deep wells in the central part of the, what I call the Moscow Pullman area to say uh, north of the highway between the two cities, uh, halfway to Kamiak Butte. We don't have any real deep wells, but we can extend by understanding the origin. I will show you how you can extend your knowledge in understanding the whole area and not just that east-west cross section that I showed you. We're going to have to review the basics of Columbia River CRB means Columbia River basalt. We need to look at the basics of basalt hydrology. These are well worked out, rolls of thumb. They've been worked, uh, determined by thousands of studies across the Columbia River Plateau. But again, how do we <laughs> summarize all those thousands of articles? I haven't read them, some I don't understand. But there are articles out there that boil down to the basics, and that's what we will use. Now, what's the important keys, and how do those keys relate to the Moscow Pullman Basin? <coughs> Excuse me. We will talk about the uh, how much what we know about our recharge. We actually, in the last uh, decade, uh, have uh, a lot of publications supported by uh, the PBAC. Uh, that's a abbreviation for the PBAC Aquifer Committee. A lot of publications, a lot of reports a lot more knowledge, increased knowledge about our recharge. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the geologic structure, what I call structural features. Talk about those wrinkles, the upfolds and downfolds, the possibility of some faults, the uh, 
occurrence of igneous dikes which influence the water movement. We'll do that in one lecture. From those parts, we will lead us up to describing the upper aquifer characteristics. The upper aquifer actually is fairly well known. Uh, we have hundreds of wells that have been drilled in the upper aquifer uh, way back, way back into the uh, uh, late 1800s. Uh, so a, we can describe and explain that aqua system pretty well. And we'll again boil it down to the basics. But it does lead us, it does give us some clues to how the lower aquifer works. And again, it's the lower aquifer we're concerned about. That's where our supplies are coming from. But we continue to drop. Water decline continues to be about a foot a year. So that's where we're heading to. To take all these pieces and parts and keys and basics uh, from these other lectures and put them together and present a model of how the lower aquifer operates. Any model, model is not always the answer, but it provides you a framework within the think. And then I'm going to think within that model and talk about the geologic controls on water level decline. Uh, not sure we'll have a summary or a conclusions, but we will have something then the last uh, the last lecture will remind us of what we should have learned from the earlier lectures. Uh, thank you for the time today. Our next lecture is on the blue space and boundaries and it's only about 20 minutes uh, long. Thank you very much.